and welcome everyone to episode 13 of the Comic Book Showcase. My name is Jamie Hari. I'm from the, the administrator of the Marvel and DC databases. Today we're going to actually be talking about something that's neither Marvel nor DC. Uh, Image Comics, a uh, character that known well and loved and still published today, uh, Invincible, uh, originally made it, uh, his first appearance in uh, Tech Jacket number 1 in 2002, uh, created by Robert Kirkman and originally drawn by uh, Corey Walker and colored by Bill Crabtree. Um, today we're going to be talking about the first few issues of the, of the first volume um, and just uh, letting you know what we think and uh, obviously we can uh, go from there. So uh, I just want to put it out there, I actually really like the first four books that we, we reviewed. Um, they were really uh, campy, they were really uh, comic book uh, cape, ca uh, character focused and uh, I think the writing was a little lackluster, I like Robert Kirkman generally. But uh, I think the writing was just very uh, hitting a you know the the nail on the head with a hammer pretty hard. Just this is a comic book story, and we're just going to tell it with no you know uh, reservations about that. So uh, just to uh, put it out there to everyone, uh, what did you guys think of the books? I really enjoyed the 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 whole story. Um, I agree. The, the first four issues kind of start off a little slowly, um, but it and I also agree that it's uh, it starts out very four color, um, classic comic book, a little bit campy uh, and fun and uh, it's but it's it's uh, it's also origin story time, right? So I expect it to start out that way. It doesn't have to doesn't have to ramp up immediately. Yeah, I thought I thought I thought it was an energetic read. Like they they tried to um, build the characters. Um, origin stories, as you say, fairly quickly. They introduced all of the characters of the family, the the team that uh, Invincible sort of uh, begins working with um, right from the get-go, and uh, there's no sort of time wasted to introduce um, his powers or um, some misadventures that he can get into with his newfound powers. So, um, yeah, I, I like the energy and the pacing of the, the first little bit there, and um, I think that... Uh, it would be hard to maintain that over, you know, a long period of time, but I think it was a good a good start. I think it's refreshing as an origin story because you don't have that. It's not really an origin story. It's just the beginning of a much longer story. Like, as an origin story, typically you have some kind of mechanism that, or the whole plot of the first several issues revolves around whatever gives the character their powers, and I think in this situation they can easily just say, it's puberty. He's gaining powers naturally. Whatever. Let's move on and do superhero stuff. And he's like, yes, I'm going to do superhero stuff right away. And there are absolutely no obstacles to him just doing superhero stuff right away. So I, I think that works out. It's, it's both good and bad because I think it's refreshing because you don't want another origin story that's just the same old origin story, but it's also kind of like it lacks in... Wax and uh, not drama, but stakes. There are no stakes associated with him gaining powers. It's just powers happening. Well, what about uh, his? In the I think it was uh, issue three or chapter three or whatever you want to call it. Um, the uh, his dad, Omni Man, uh, is captured uh, by some aliens when he goes off into a portal to another dimension. Um, was there no stake in sort of... I mean, obviously, he didn't have to rescue his dad, and his dad just one day shows up at dinner, uh, which is kind of fun. But um, is there not sort of like um, an implied stake that his son is picking up the mantle and either helping him with future adventures or carrying on when, you know, potentially he eventually kicks the bucket, that type of thing? Like, is it not an implied stake more than just like, okay, there's a particular bad guy right now attacking the world right now, and if we don't save him, the world is coming to an end? Like, rather than that sort of... Um, you know, explicit um, danger. The, but should it be implied? Like, should I have to read between the lines, really? <laughs> I think it's it's still, like, the stakes in the scene are, like, I don't know. It's, it's still, as I was reading that particular scene, it just felt like, here's a bunch of action for the sake of having some action, and oh, no, Dad's gone, and you think maybe that's going to be a big deal, and then it turns out that's just a side story that you never really hear about again until the end. So Kyle, what, what do you think about like the family dynamics? Like, 
um, you know, he disappears for what apparently was months in his time or in that alien world's time, and then just come kind of shows up for dinner like two days later. Um, how did how did that strike you? That the the way the family dynamic was portrayed. I thought it was a really interesting take on just how a superhero family kind of reacts. I mean, a lot of comics, you don't really see the domestic lives of the heroes that much, and even when you do, it's kind of more of a of a just kind of like between missions, you know, recouping and regathering, and there's not really any any downtime. And this kind of shows a family that has that that little bit of downtime in between their adventures and. It was kind of refreshing to me to see that they were just so nonchalant about everything going on and kind of like, oh, dad's missing, you know, hopefully he's okay, but he'll probably turn up, in a, you know, when he's done. So here, pass the potatoes, you know, we're good to go. It's just kind of an interesting, an interesting view of the family that we've not really seen, I don't think, in superhero comics. I think one of my favorite moments where it's kind of like... In the family, they tend to just say, oh, superpowers. You've got superpowers. Great. Pass the potatoes. It, it was good to see in the scene where he comes home late and his mom is watching TV and it turns out she's actually really worried about her da- or his dad, even though she did brush it off earlier. It's nice when she's like, I'm actually kind of worried about him. Where is he? Because that's... That felt like the most emotional moment in the entire book for me. Just the first four issues, of course. But it felt like the most emotional moment in that first four issues, which, again, I, I'm coming off as though I didn't really like it that much, but that's just, what I'm, that's just my experience. So did um, uh, did you guys feel the same way I did, that sort of the, the relationship between... Um, uh, Adam Eve and you know Rexplode and Duplicate and Robot, sort of that that crew, uh, and Invincible was somewhat contrived in the way that they just, um, hey look you're here we're fighting we're about to fight the same bad guy and then hey that's pretty cool that you helped us and now hey we're best friends and hey now you're on the team like it seemed like there wasn't enough build up there there wasn't enough um, uh, realistic interaction um, just kind of to your point that um, you know. I don't know, it, it felt like that part was a little bit rushed. Like, I like the pacing of the story generally, but that the the most emotional part might have been in Invincible's sort of relationships with his peers and his parents, of course, but but it just felt like there was nothing there. Like, he maybe had uh, was slightly attracted in Adam Eve, but other than that, it just kind of felt flat for me. I thought it was, seemed like it was just really easy. Like, it just, like, yeah, they met... Like, oh, we're on the same side. Okay, let's be teammates. And it seemed like there really wasn't any kind of build up or, you know, like the superhero convention where two superheroes meet and they must fight each other. It was kind of, they skipped over all that and they just became best friends. But also, I think that's kind of, to me, it seemed like that was the whole, the whole feel of the book. It was just kind of everything is accepted. Like, I have superpowers. Okay, I'm a superhero. Like, there's another group of superhero teenagers. We're a team. Like, everything is just kind of, Easy and accepted. I agree. Um, they, they, this is not the X-Men. This is not the Avengers. This is not the Justice League where they meet him and then everyone goes back up to their base and then they vote on whether or not they're going to set some kind of set of trials for Invincible. Right? It, 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 is, it is accepted. But when you get further along in the story, that's where the, the cracks start to show, which we're not seeing in the first four issues. That's a good point. So, um, we... Uh, what, uh, so actually, I just want to touch on something that um, sort of to take a bit of a tangent. Um, I actually really liked um, the cuteness of the book, like uh, just the the um, the shortness of each of the interactions and uh, some of the Easter eggs that were presented. Like I th- I think that some of the things that made it a, a fun read were not necessarily the dialogue. Um, in its, you know, rich tapestry of like metaphors and deep meanings and things like that, but it, it's sort of lightness and cheer, cheerfulness of its uh, a- attitude, and um, just you know, just to talk a little bit about the Easter eggs, the the, the first four issues, you know, we were talking about this uh, storyline called sort of Family Matters, which obviously has the double entendre uh, of uh, introducing the character Invincible and his mother and father, but also um, there were actually a lot of references to the, uh, what was that, the 90s TV show, uh, Family Matters. Uh, I caught three when I was just reading it through the first time. The, the school was named um, 
Oh, uh, Oh, so the principal was named Winslow. Uh, one of the characters that he sticks up for in the hall was um, Steve White, which is a mix of uh, Steve Urkel and Jaleel White, the, character, the actor who plays the character. And uh, the school, if I'm not mistaken, was Reginald Val Johnson, which is the name of the actor that plays the father in that show, uh, Carl Winslow. So I, and then there was a couple of other um, uh, Easter eggs that uh, were fun to discover. But I, I like the cheerful attitude of it. Um, did you guys uh, agree that it was very... I mean, happy, to, to pick a word? Yeah, I thought so. I, I also feel like, I don't know how the book develops from here, but this is a book I wouldn't feel weird about giving to, like, a 10-year-old to read. Like, it was, it was, it was smart, but it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't too dark. It wasn't too complex. It wasn't, you know, it was everything that you can enjoy, but it's still, like, you know, give to a little kid to read or something like that. I would agree for the first four issues. That's what it looks like. But the violence is more graphic further along than anything in Marvel and DC. Like, maybe with a, a couple of exceptions. Um, but even that is weird because it's the colors, the color choices, they're so bright. And it, it's, it's still, you know, the, the happy superhero place, but all of a sudden, boom, extreme violence. But to start off with, yeah. And, 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 and to let's, let's go back and, and just pick on the point. It's Robert Kirkman, <laughs> so uh, you know the the guy famous for The Walking Dead. So um, violence is is in his nature. The only the only possibly more violent and death bringing writer that's sort of popular mainstream right now is George R. R. Martin. So um, yeah, we shouldn't be terribly surprised to see uh, the a sort of a not a darkening of the mood, but certainly an increase in the gore. I feel like it's a good book in terms of lightness, but I think that also comes with the, it's a double-edged sword in terms of like, if the book is fun and light and doesn't get too heavy, then it's kind of also just a throwaway, like it's disposable to some extent, which is, I'm sure that it gets better, but just these four issues. We should definitely return to this series later when it gets intense, but just these first four issues, one of my main criticisms of it is that there's no real moral, there's no message. It's like, here's just a story about superheroes. It makes a lot of references. It's very, it's an homage in a lot of ways, but it's not trying to tell you anything. It's just, here's a fun story about this kid who's got superpowers, and that's good, but it's also not going to change anybody's life. So, so let me ask that the question back to you then. Does it need to? Does it does it have to have a message? Like, I, I mean, just thinking about it, just objectively for a second. If the purpose, the sole purpose, is for it to be entertaining, and each interaction and playful, you know, um, either soliloquy or you know the the panel or, or the the whatever the interaction is, if it's not interesting, then uh, isn't that just kind of the point? Like, if, if they can tell an interesting story book to book but not make you walk away fe feeling like you were preached at, um, isn't that just as good? Well, it's a fine line between preaching and sending a message, like, well. But I think it's, yeah. like I said, it's a good book, and it can stand on its own. But I feel like, ultimately, it's not going to make me go back and think, oh, wow that book really made an impact on me because it doesn't have anything in it to make an impact. Just sure. those first four issues, of course. Caveat, always saying that. <laughs> yeah. But, like, look at, like, reality TV or game shows or things like that. They're like, they have no point. There's no point. But yet they draw millions of people to be enter mindlessly entertained for 30 minutes at a, at a time. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I have no counter-argument for that. <laughs> Fair enough. So what do we think of the actual characters? Like, I mean, obviously, uh, we're still, again, as Rav pointed out, we're just kind of talking about the intro. We're just, we're going back and revisiting this this um, uh, book that is uh, a decade old now, and, and we want to, um, you know, just without talking about what happens in issue 112, which just came out on um, uh, June 25th of this year, um, what did we think about the characters themselves, like, the, the plot, like, um, the characters' powers weren't fully explored in the first few issues. I mean, or they were largely explained or seen, but they weren't sort of explored in the way that, say, Superman's, you know, always getting a new power every 
new writer seems to have a new power for him. But, um, like, I guess my question is, are the characters um, significantly differentiated from other characters of the ilk, or is it, do we think that they're just kind of um, flat delivery mechanisms for a story? I think that, uh, speaking of flat delivery, I think that the father, his sort of deadpan kind of, like he's funny because he's kind of deadpan, and his, he's not like Superman. He's like he's like the dad in Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. <laughs> Have you ever seen that movie? And he's yeah. just a very quiet man who every now and then has to has to sit his son down and have a big speech about something that happened to him, so or that is happening to his son. But I think that that characterization is kind of neat. I like the idea of a a major superhero who's just kind of like not a uh, not full of righteous justice glory kind of stuff. He's just a guy. Okay, so before we actually get to Elena, what Elena had to say, uh, we're actually going to wrap this week's episode right there. Um, uh, so, you know, let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, we actually want you to, we're challenging you this week to go out and go back, get it, the first few issues, whether it's on Comixology or wherever the case may be, go back and reread uh, uh, Invincible from the start. Let us know what you think uh, in the comments. Tell us uh, if you're reading it right now, if you're at uh, issue 112, and what you think of uh, what's going on in the, the storyline today. And if you do post something like that, just give a spoiler alert or something. But um, anyway, thank you very much for joining us, and as always, and we look forward to speaking with you guys all next week. Take care. And that's a wrap for another episode of the Comic Book Showcase. Join us again live via chat or Twitter next week. Like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. And to learn more about today's topics, check out the Marvel and DC databases on Wikia the ultimate resources for comic book information anywhere.